99% of all people have no idea what hyperventilation is, and that includes a lot of freedivers. Me, myself, it took me years to figure out the true essence of hyperventilation, and Wim Hofers, for instance, they are notorious for hyperventilating without knowing. In this video, I will break down what exactly is hyperventilation and how you can know whether you're hyperventilating or not. If you're new to this channel, my name is Gerd Leroy. I'm a freediving instructor and coach, a former national record holder. And on this channel, I have helped thousands hold their breath longer. And today it's all about hyperventilation. So let me start with the definition of hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is breathing more than your metabolic needs. So it is breathing more air than your body needs to for a given activity, whether that is in rest or whether you're exercising. So breathing more air than you need to over a certain time span is defined as hyperventilation. So one thing to keep in mind is that hyperventilation is not defined by the technique, by the way you breathe. It is only defined by the volume of air that you breathe. So if you breathe more than what you need, more volume of air, you are over breathing. Now, what is the volume of air that you need? Well, we define this as tidal breathing. When you are in rest, when you're just uh, relaxing, watching TV, reading a book, that's what we define as tidal breathing. It is 0.5 liters per ventilation. If you ventilate 12 breaths per minute, that would be six liters of air exchange, gas exchange per minute. If you breathe more than those six liters per minute, that is defined as hyperventilation. So let's say you would be doing two, four breathing or four, eight breathing. Let's stick to four, eight. So breathing in over the count of four and then exhaling, breathing out over the count of eight. Is this hyperventilation? Well, if you would breathe in a little bit of air, then that might not be hyperventilation. If you would breathe in a lot of air, then probably the amount of air that you exchange per minute will be more than tidal breathing, more than six liters per minute, and then you will be hyperventilating. So a few common misconceptions about hyperventilating is uh, it only happens when you're panicking. So especially the Wim Hofers, they think that uh, hyperventilation is uh, defined by a panic attack. Yes, when you have a panic attack and you start breathing more heavily, then most likely you will be hyperventilating but that does not define hyperventilation. So you don't have to get into a panic attack to hyperventilate. You can be perfectly calm and in control and still hyperventilate. All you have to do is breathe more air than tidal breathing. Another misconception, if you breathe calmly, it is not hyperventilation. No, that is wrong as well, because you can breathe calmly, but breathe in more air, more volume of air, and still be hyperventilating. For instance, I could breathe calmly, very calmly, but if I breathe through my mouth and I take in a lot of air, I'm still breathing calmly, right? What does that even mean, calmly? I mean, we could have a discussion about what is calm, what is breathing calmly. So if you breathe in a lot of air while you're calm, you are still hyperventilating if the amount of exchanged air is more than six liters per minute. And another misconception is that people think it's only bad when you start feeling dizzy in the head, this lightheadedness. Well, when you feel that, this dizziness in here, that is because you've been hyperventilating quite heavily already, hyperventilation causes vasoconstriction to the blood vessels, uh, vasoconstriction to the vital organs like your heart, your lungs, and your brain. So when you get vasoconstriction to the brain, you're getting less blood flow and there's less oxygen, and that's why you start feeling dizzy. So that's a result of heavy hyperventilation. Now, that doesn't mean that only heavy hyperventilation would be a bad thing. You can already uh, do mild hyperventilation by just breathing less deeply and, and, and less rapid, but still hyperventilation, mild hyperventilation. That is also hyperventilation, and whether it's bad or a good thing, that's a whole other discussion. Of course, it depends on on the purposes, but for freediving or for general health and longevity, I would recommend not hyperventilate at all and stick to tidal breathing. Now, let me talk a bit about the Wim Hof method because there is so much uh, misconception about that. So does the Wim Hof method increase oxygen? No, of course not, because we already have a 95 to 99% SpO2 oxygen saturation. So the hyperventilation does not increase that anymore. Now, Okay, if you would put an oximeter on your finger, you might actually see that it goes up with 1%. So if you would have like 98% SpO2 
after hyperventilation, it would indeed go up to 99%. So maybe that's why some Wim Hofers say, yeah, the method does increase your oxygen saturation. Now, it's only 1% and it is only temporarily. And on top of that, there's a lot of other uh, factors that um, we could discuss on why this method does not increase oxygen. And that is a reduced bore effect, a reduced mammalian diving reflex, vasoconstriction to the brain. So long story short, the Wim Hof method does not increase your oxygen. What it does, it is lowering CO2. It lowers your CO2 and that makes the breath hold easier, at least if you're a beginner. And that's why people think it increases oxygen because they feel like they can hold their breath longer. And they can indeed hold their breath longer because the low CO2 doesn't give them the urge to breathe, at least not that rapid. So they feel they can hold their breath twice as long or even three times as long because the urge to breathe comes later. So another argument you might hear from Wim Hofers that is, okay, Gert, we understand we are doing a hyperventilation on these deep cycles, but when we do the retention, the breath holds, then the CO2 is actually going up again. So that kind of compensates the lowering of the CO2 that we're doing during these breathe up cycles. Okay, so when you hold your breath, indeed your CO2 goes back up, but on a Wim Hof breath hold or any other breath hold that is after hyperventilation, your CO2 levels do not go up as high as if you would be holding your breath after normal breathing, tidal breathing. And that's why a Wim Hof breath hold is called a hypoxic breath hold because hypoxia, low levels of O2, come before hypercapnia. And hypercapnia is high levels of CO2. So on a normal breath hold, tidal breathing, what you will feel first that stops your breath hold is high CO2, hypercapnia. That is what gives you the urge to breathe and that's what makes you stop holding your breath before you reach low levels of O2 and before you would black out. Now, why do people black out more easily on Wim Hof breath holds or any breath hold after hyperventilation? That's why we're not doing this in freediving. It is because the urge to breathe, the high CO2 is delayed, which gives the chance to lower oxygen to occur, hypoxia to occur. So you have a higher probability, a higher chance to get into a hypoxia, low oxygen, before you reach that urge to breathe. And if you get into hypoxia, almost hypoxia, then of course the chances of blacking out are very high. So does the Wim Hof breath hold increase CO2? Yeah, of course, any breath hold increases CO2, but not as much as a normal breath hold and it comes with a lot of risks, and not only the risk of blacking out, but also the fact that you will never train your CO2 tolerance as well as if you would on a normal tidal breathing breath hold. Does that make sense? So in the beginning of this video, I mentioned that even freedivers get this wrong, right? Like what exactly is hyperventilation? And I do want to talk a bit about this, because even in the freediving community, there is a lot of misconception about hyperventilation. And I want to go back now to the education system apnea total, because that is the education system under which I did my education 10 years ago. By now, a lot has happened, of course, but then I was doing my freediving courses with apnea total. And um, maybe you're not familiar with this, but apnea total is a bit different than other uh, freediving education systems like SSI, uh, ADA, Motionoffs, uh, PADI, because all of them, they teach uh, tidal breathing as a breed up whereas apnea total teaches different breed ups. So for freediving, vertical freediving, apnea total teaches the kind of long controlled inhalations and long controlled exhalations, which is not tidal breathing, of course, because the moment you are manipulating your uh, breath, this is not tidal breathing anymore. Now, for years in the freediving community, this has been frowned upon and many people um, have been uh, trying to ridicule apnea total for teaching hyperventilation and how can they do that? How can, how can apnea total teach hyperventilation? And I want to say something about this because those people don't actually know what is hyperventilation. Like I've mentioned before in this video, hyperventilation is not defined by the technique. So whether you do like 10 seconds in, 10 seconds out, that does not necessarily mean it's hyperventilation. If you would breathe in just a little bit of air, and over a minute, the exchanged volume of air would be less than six liters or equal, then it would not be hyperventilation. If it would be less than six liters, it's even hypoventilation, it's underbreathing. 
if it would be the same, then it's tidal breathing or the same volume as tidal breathing. It's only hyperventilation when we breathe more than those six liters. Now, how do you know that? You don't know. You don't know. So you cannot say that apnea total is teaching hyperventilation because you don't know. Now, okay, that is theory. Now, in practice, many people, and especially beginners, they will breathe more than they should, and they will eventually be hyperventilating. So it is the job of the instructor to notice this and to breathe less air over that extended long inhalation and exhalation so that it is not hyperventilation. But just looking at the technique itself, 10 seconds in, 10 seconds out, or whatever it is, that is not hyperventilation. So can we say that apnea total is teaching hyperventilation? Not really. Now I do agree we have to be extremely careful with this because people, especially beginners, are always overdoing it. So that's why we simplify this. That's why all the other education systems just simply stick to tidal breathing because that's easier to communicate. The way apnea total is doing it is, is more complicated, of course, because you don't really know whether they are hyperventilating or not. Now let's stick a little more with apnea total. They are teaching a different breed up for static. So for the static, um, static apnea, they're teaching the five, five breed up, the five seconds in and five seconds out. And also that has been frowned upon for a long time. Now, again, I have to step in here. When we take a look at world record holders, uh, static apnea and, in, and people who hit 10, nine, eight minute breath hold static apnea, almost all of them now are using the 5-5 five, five breed up. Now, is this hyperventilation? Yes, it is. There's no doubt about this. I mean, yeah, you could breathe less and then it would not be hyperventilation, but that's not how we practice it. When we practice the 5-5 five, five breed up for mild, mild hyperventilation for static apnea, it is hyperventilation, it's mild hyperventilation. So that is not the discussion here. The discussion is that apnea total has been ridiculed for this for many, many, many years. And now we see the top breath holders using exactly that breed up. So this just shows that in this freediving community, people do not always know how things are. They do not always understand the concepts in the best possible way. And they might not always have the most open mind or be open for new ideas. So, okay, you understand now the concept of hyperventilation. You know what it is. Now you want to know when you're doing a certain breathing technique or method or a certain way of breathing, am I hyperventilating or not? That's what you want to know, right? Well, there's only one way to know this, and that is to measure the volume of air you're breathing in and out. But we're not doing that, right? I mean... Who the hell walks around with a, a spirometer or a CO2 meter or whatever device that can measure the flux of air coming in and out? We don't do that. We don't free dive with devices measuring what we are breathing. So we don't know whether we're hyperventilating or not unless we do tidal breathing. When we do tidal breathing, then we know we are not hyperventilating. And that's why most of the free diving education systems, besides apnea total, they just tell you to do tidal breathing as a breed up because it's so much easier. It's so much more straightforward. And it's something that the student can hold on to like, okay, yeah, I know I have to do tidal breathing. Because if you tell a student, you can do whatever breathing technique, just make sure you don't hyperventilate. That's impossible for a beginner to follow up. You cannot execute on this. So to keep things simple, we say do tidal breathing. So we are sure you are not hyperventilating. But even then, even then, we cannot be 100% sure because some people, when they focus too much on the tidal breathing, they start to breathe more. When you do tidal breathing, it's actually unconscious breathing. It's breathing like when you are watching TV, reading a book. So then you are unconscious about breathing. It's normal resting breathing. is the way your body automatically starts breathing when you are in rest position, resting in a state. But when you put your mind at breathing, when you become conscious about that breathing, it might not be tidal breathing anymore. So even when you tell someone to tidal breathe, that is not necessarily a guarantee that person will not be hyperventilating. I know this is not easy and that's why freediving is not a sport for everyone. This is a sport for people who want to understand. 
even when you're doing mild hyperventilation for static apnea, the 5-5 method, you could ask yourself, how much should I hyperventilate? Because we're talking about mild hyperventilation, but what does that even mean? I mean, are we measuring how much we're breathing so we know that it's mild hyperventilation and how mild should it be? We don't know. So the only way that we can know whether we're breathing enough, too much or not too much, is by experimenting with it. You can breathe more, and if you're on a certain breath hold or start reaching um, a hypoxia and are almost a blacking out or even maybe a little LMC, then you know you have uh, been hyperventilating too much. If you did not reach hypoxia yet, then maybe you can get away with a little bit more hyperventilation. So this is something that you really have to figure out for yourself by experimenting or with, with uh, experience, right? Do this more and more, only for static apnea, of course. In the beginning, when you do shorter breath holds, you could hyperventilate a bit more because you'll probably not reach hypoxia limits. But when you feel that you're reaching hypoxia more, when you don't have everything under control anymore at the end of a breath hold, that's a warning sign telling you, hey, you, you are reaching hypoxic limits here. So then you have to hyperventilate a little bit less, a little bit less. It's a trial and error, I guess. I hope you don't get to the error side of it. So um, this is how it goes, uh, figuring out how much you can hyperventilate on static apnea. And another question you could ask me is, um, for instance, in the underwater squat, my community on school, school.com slash underwater squat, we do two purges before a breath hold. So on normal tidal breathing, before we take the final breath, we always do two purges. And you might ask yourself, is, is this hyperventilation? Well, that's a good question. Theoretically, that would be hyperventilation when you take those two bigger breaths, because you don't need to take those two bigger breaths. You are breathing more than your metabolic needs at that moment. So yes, those two bigger breaths would be hyperventilation. But because it's only two breaths, we do not really consider this as hyperventilation. Theoretically, yes, but I would not worry about that. The reason we're doing those two bigger breaths is just to give you a better feeling. It's like two sighs. It's like, ah, ah, this feels good. And it helps a lot of people getting into the zone. It helps a lot of people relaxing a bit more before they take their final breath. So that's a good thing, you know, that's a good thing. If it's only two breaths, we do not consider this as um, hyperventilation. We should look at the breathing method for at least, let's say, 30 seconds before we can start defining it as hyperventilation or not. Guys, if you want to learn more about hyperventilation and get free dive ready, train your breath hold at home, then join my underwater squad, school.com slash underwater squad. You'll get access to our full breath hold training system, live sessions, and a worldwide community. Click the link in the description, school.com slash underwater squad. And if you want to see a video about the freediving breed up, then click this video here. Peace and every breath.